Good evening and welcome to Tinkering with Edkelar. Time for another, slightly larger project. What I got here is one of the first, if not the first, logic analyzers. An HP 1600A. The service manual I got for it was printed in September 1975, which makes it ever so slightly older than myself. I don't know when this particular one was made, but I assume it would be about that time. And yes, it does look suspiciously like an old oscilloscope, because it almost is one. HP repurposed the case and display of one and integrated it with the logic analyzer board instead of the analog amplifier that would go into a scope. The model here has 16 data bits and one clock input. HP didn't bother with 8 bit apparently. And the best thing, if you got the 1607A model, which is essentially the same core without the integrated scope part, you can connect them together to form a 32-bit one. The unit arrived without any accessories, no bag for the probes and also no probes. The front panel looked in dire need of cleaning and the back was rather gritty and oxidized. Judging by the oxidation of all the IC pins and the back panel, this might be another flood victim. Taking the main logic board out is a bit of a chore already. It is wedged in there between the front panel and an ISA style board connector. Better not use too much force. The high voltage power supply sports a nice warning and while the anode is plugged in, all the other lines are soldered in place. Why? Like always, sensitive parts come out first. In this case, the CRT is on the top of my list. The deflection pins are almost fused together and take more force to pull off than I'd like, but it seems that nothing is damaged. And every screw reveals more grime trapped inside. The boards are folded up and stacked like some of the best, or worst, PCB origami I've ever seen without resorting to flat flex. The CRT driver board is the first one that wants to leave the enclosure. followed by the main logic board on the bottom. Oh look, botches! Or is that some creative signal routing? 
the fact that most of them are twisted pairs is a bit weird. Still trying to remove the tube, but I didn't see how without removing the front panel first, so I'm going for the buttons and knobs next. And finally I saw that the screen bezel clips in from the front. Hooray for hidden screws! And a dead end. It might have been intended to move the CRT through this opening, but the rubber gasket around it has hardened and it is impossible to move it through the cutout without force. And glass tube plus force equals no way. So I carefully continue to remove parts, with the CRT getting more wobbly by the minute. I got so caught up in the process that I missed that my camera ran out of battery while I finally got the front panel off. Oh well, here's a money shot instead. Continuing the disassembly, the power supply board is now visible. The mains transformer is soldered onto the rectifier board, which also hosts some large filter caps. The main 5 volt rectifier is mounted off board against the back plane for heat sinking. What horrors await behind the heat sink? Oh, just a few wires and linear regulators. But there's quite a bit of rust accumulated on the thermal pads. All the mains wiring is soldered. I keep getting asked why I solder these power connectors. Answer: I have not yet seen any that would use spade connectors.
While I like the fact that the unit is multi-voltage, that selection switch combo holds onto the transformer way too tightly. And finally, the transformer seems to come loose. And whoa, Rust Central! That one BNC connector on the back? That was really stuck. It just so fits one of the sockets I had around. And again, a weird combination of soldered versus plugged in inside the high voltage part. All the LEDs are clipped into the front panel. Interesting design, makes them look more like incandescent bulbs from the outside. And finally, the last bits of the case come apart, including the handle hinges which reveal even more rust. The mains transformer is coated in rust. I am not sure how the insides look, but it seems that it might have been dipped in lacquer. Since it isn't bulging, I'll just get rid of the surface rust. Clean up time! The sliding switches also contain visible rust, so in we go! The solder on most of the pads was so oxidized that it wouldn't melt anymore, not even with plenty of fresh solder added. Quite a few pads came out with the switches instead. And some pins came out of the switches. Thankfully, these are all TTL level switches and easily repaired. On a general note, I am aware that most people would just flush potentiometers and switches with contact cleaner and call it a day. But let me ask you, 
where does the gunk go that was in there to begin with? Unless you can flush it out somehow, it might cause problems again soon. And that's why I generally prefer to take switches apart and clean them, leaving the dirt out when reassembling them. The power switch also needed a bit of repair after opening it, but you can clearly see all the rust around it, I didn't want to keep it like that. For the trigger switches, I just did a quick flush with contact cleaner and IPA. The encoding switches for the trigger delay are standard rotary encoders, also rather easy to clean. So easy in fact that the zero rubbed right off, yikes! Time for some good old rub on lettering, not exactly the same font, but close enough. Resoldering the switches and cleaning the boards. Plenty good. Recapping time. This time there's even a regular cap that needs it. There is quite a bit of oxidation on the pins of the chips. I went over it with a fiberglass eraser and got them clean again. At least they all seem to be still intact. The probe socket covers are a bit yellowed. Might be nicotine. A magic eraser worked wonders.
And this is a good point to take a break for part 2. See you next time! The power supply board is now visible. Visible?